you're going to see why this is so important, why it relates to Solus Veritas, and why so many people believe Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. I believe it a, a large part, the, 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 the biggest part of why people believe that, yeah, the biggest part is, is Revelation 111. Oh, yeah, because let me bring you guys up here back to the Bible Hub. We go there. Look at what we see. Let me get a little bigger. Oh, it's in that. Let's go to uh, multi so I can show you guys the difference, right? And I discussed this in that video I just showed you. But we're going to focus in on this, okay? This relates directly to Solus Veritas, how you, I believe, should approach issues like this when it comes to texts related to the Bible or anything else, but we're talking about the Bible, and deal with people who have problems with inerrancy or infallibility or use the King James, right? They think, you know, King James only, and it's the only incorrupt version of the Bible, based on the Texas Receptus, right? Which is essentially Erasmus, um, 12th century text, right? Byzantine text type that was later edited by Stephanus and then presented in a final form uh, by another party, Beze. So, but when it was presented in its final form, it, and used thereafter, right, to come, become the basis of the King James and, and considered the received text, right? But it really, especially for books like Revelation, wasn't compiled in any <laughs> any kind, any way that would represent what we're talking about, using the best available evidence. Now, maybe for those who had it, but again, um, it isn't, right? Even if, even if for example, the... Uh, editors of the Texas Receptus thought it was the uh, in uncorrupt version of the New Testament. That doesn't mean it is, right? How would we know that? Just because they say so? No, we would have to do as we've been talking about and as I hope we're doing with everything. Okay, well, what was the basis for their text? And what text did they have available or are available now that tell us if that is, in fact, what it is, this received incorruptible text, that no matter what's in it, basically, that's what we use. Okay, well, look at Revelation 111. There's the New International Version, right? Right on, it says, it kind of continues from verse 10. It's Jesus talking. You just can't tell that yet, but it eventually is revealed to be him. Verse 10, on the Lord's day I was in the spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Right, so no big deal, right? And it just goes on from there. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And that's then it goes on to identify Jesus, like we all read when it comes to describing him, right? He describes himself, or he's described by John. So, well, so what's the big deal, right? Let's look at another translation, New American Standard. Basically, the same thing, right? Continuation from verse ten, voice like a trumpet, saying, "Write in the book what you see and send to the seven churches." That's just doesn't seem like anything big at all right oh but look right below that look at the king james right below <clears throat> new american standard let me in fact uh see if i can make this a little bit better here okay that's basically the main part right so look at that you see the difference now right the King James has this. It's not in the NIV or the New American Standard or the New World Translation. 
or any Bible that's not based on the Textus Receptus. That's a pretty big difference, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I mean, the reason this is so important, there's, there's a couple reasons, but if, if this reading is true, the King James reading I'm highlighting for you right here, if that's the correct reading, then there's no question Jesus is speaking directly as the Alpha and the Omega. Now, that's still not a problem for me or anybody I know who believes like I do, because we believe Jesus does the very thing that these other, these other angels in Revelation and all throughout the Old Testament do. They speak directly as God. Now, but but this is this would be just a lot more obvious and direct in a way that that would make it harder for a Trinitarian to right, they would have to be, and I think they could be. I mean, if you look at our whole series on the angels of Jawa in the Old Testament, right? You look at how the book of Acts views these angels. Um, you look at how Jesus and his angels in Revelation are acting after he gets a revelation from God. His God, whose name is different from his, as he says in Revelation 3.12, in terms of what is written, the name that is written, right? So I don't have a problem at all, right? He's on God's throne with all authority. To me, Jesus is literally God to everybody as the Father. In other words, well, he's still Jesus. I'm not saying that. But there's no difference in terms of the, the authority, right? The, what he's doing. He's doing exactly, the Father has given everything to him. So we still pray to God in his name. He told us to do that. But he's right there. You understand? So he, has, he is literally speaking as God to us. Well, just like they are all throughout the Bible, right? They don't speak as themselves. That's the whole point of what I just got through, you know, destroying Sam over and everything we keep telling these guys. That's the reason why it's okay for them to be called gods. That's the only reason it's okay for the sons of God to be gods like Jesus teaches without breaking scripture, John 10. And that's the only reason why it's okay for him to be the only begotten God who reveals the Father. Because they're not acting as themselves ever when they do that. It doesn't mean that like the angel who is doing just that. If you watch the video, I just referenced that, that video on my site, Revelation 22. I have other videos on it. We'll talk about more. That, that very angel that John tries to worship, and the, the angel says, don't do that. Right before that and right after that is speaking as either God or Jesus in the first person, okay? And so that's why you also at times have accounts in the Old Testament where the angel's speaking directly as God or when, like, Manoah asks the angel of Yahweh his name, he says, why are you asking about that? It's, it's too special, right? He Unlike Ya'ol, who reveals his name all over the place, uh, this angel won't do it out of regard for Ya'ol. But it's speaking on its own when it tells him he's not going to do that, like the angel in Revelation 22. So they're still individual sons of God, right? But that's not a comp... When they talk like that, when they're just being themselves, they're not compromising anything. Ya'ol isn't expecting them not to be a normal person. <laughs> He's expecting them to represent him exactly, entirely, and no one else when they are speaking his words, his will. And that's what they do. No one more than Jesus. Okay, so ultimately, to me, this is not a problem. But it would just make it harder to convince, right? And Trinitarians who don't understand, like, Trinitarians are not taught theologically what we are, right? Like what we teach and read in the Old Testament about these angels. 
and how we see in the book of Acts, how they interpreted accounts where it doesn't say anything about angels, like Exodus 19. It's literally like speaking about Yahoo in the most absolute ways other than being different from how Moses has to be protected from his glory in his face. So we know it's different. But Acts makes that clear, right? There are angels there. So, but Trinitarians don't believe all that. They kind of do, or like what Sam were arguing with over this whole angel of the Lord, they'll ultimately say, yeah, that's, but they'll just say Trinity there. They don't understand this whole representational thing. They don't, they don't. Like we've seen, they think if you talk this way, you have to be God. Even though in Revelation 22, that the, the, what one of the accounts they like to quote the most, it's the exact opposite, right? <laughs> you literally have an angel who rejects worship, so it can't be God, saying from the first person, he's coming quickly. <laughs> So I guess that must be Jesus then, right? <laughs> Maybe we're looking at that account wrong. <laughs> Maybe that's it, Trinitarians. Maybe the angel who's talking from the first person, I'm coming quickly before John tries to worship him, and he says, no, don't do that. I guess that's Jesus. Who else will be coming quickly and tell him not to worship him? Oh, an angel and the sons of God who's speaking for Jesus and God? Exactly. So this is the model we have throughout all the Bible. Not one place every place john 20 20 everywhere what did he tell you in john 20 17 who is our god who is our father his god and his father i mean that, that's your answer right there you don't need to try to figure out all this complex representationalism and ident you know the angels it, it is important and, and eventually yeah but to, to figure out what the Bible ex explicitly and clearly teaches? No. Not even close, right? Does, is Jesus clear? Yeah, they think it, John 20, 28 is clear, but somehow they can't figure out John 2017, right? <laughs> it's so baffling. And yet we look at them both and think, oh, well, it's obvious. He just said our God is the Father. He just said his God is the Father. So he's the Father here to us, right? <laughs> just like in the Old Testament. Problem is, even people like you and me who believe that, it's it's something we had to learn almost on our own, right? Or through groups like Watchtower who have a non-Trinitarian view help us along the way because they don't teach that. Nobody, they're not thinking in these ways like we are. So for them, when when in in their Bibles in the King James. And it's also in the New King James, right? Or King James 2000, down here. Right there. Right, so this is, they're not changing this. <laughs> so, when they see this, though, everybody, didn't I just have that? No, I must let it go. When they see this, they're not thinking like you and I do, okay? Not even close. You know what they think, people that, almost everybody who uses the King James? Uh, except maybe some, obviously, who aren't Trinitarian. When, when Trinitarians who use the King James see this, to them it's like, how can you not believe in the Trinity? Are you, you see, see what, and, and you can almost, you can kind of understand, right? All their Bibles say this, everybody. Oh, yeah. Every single one. The most popular Bible. If you do a search, I searched earlier before the show. King James is by far 55% the most widely used Bible in history. I couldn't get exact like sales figures. I was trying to like narrow it down a little bit, but I couldn't get all that data in time. <laughs> So think of how long uh, and how many people have been misled, as I'm going to show, by this text. And again, well, I think ultimately it, it shouldn't have made any difference if you weren't already loyal to pagan uh, Constantinian paganism. The fact is, this kind of thing is huge, doctrinally. 
It's it's the it would be the most explicit statement by Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Okay. So it's a big deal. Even if, like me, you view it in the representational sense, it would have to be at least considered in that light. And so, but I don't do that. I don't see this as a legitimate reading. But I don't see it as a problem. I but I what I do see is a problem, and it is a problem for people who aren't interpreting it correctly, right? So it's not a problem for someone like me because all the other Alpha and the Omega texts I interpret the same way. They do too, but this one here is again the most explicit, okay? So it reinforces this in their view, this Trinitarianism, this Alpha and the Omega identity. It's more deeply entrenched in their mind than I think a lot of non-Trinitarians understand, because again, most of us are, are using non-King James Bibles. Although there's probably a good percentage that are. Still, right, we're reading Revelation 111, and we're seeing... Right here. There's no Alpha and the Omega. No first, no. See how much of a difference it is? It just goes from saying, right in the book, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest. So there's a big difference here that's doctrinally significant. And now let me show you the real key issue, okay? So it might be, you so... <laughs> If this was a case where the manuscript authority, right, the, the actual textual authority and the historicity of the reading, what we can trace it to, different writers or texts. If it were something like in our first example from part two, where the, 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 the authority is basically the same in the different among the different readings. Well, then we would have to choose between basically equal authorities for each reading, right? Then it would be something where we use Solus Veritas to see if we can identify the better reading. We couldn't do that with our first example because they were all equal in their basic textual history, historicity and credibility. That's why it was a legitimate contradiction should be maintained, but we could explain it and how it happened without compromising any of the other accounts or parts of the book even, right? And just because that's a uh, a corruption that's been that's that's been maintained in the accepted text, best best authority for the Gospel of Mark, that, that doesn't mean that it necessarily was the original reading because we can see what happened. We have the other two readings that tell us what happened, and we have a likely translation issue as well, plus several hundred years during which the Christians were persecuted in ways where they had a hard time maintaining their copies of the text. Okay, so then the dragon emperor comes along, Constantine, then they start having all these councils, or at least the Council of Nicaea, they're gathering their copies of books are being, whatever is available, brought to them. They start making new copies. You know, Rome starts going through all these troubles again. It gets sacked. More lost copies. So, you know, the, the the history of the text hasn't been free from difficulty, but the ones who've been preserving it have, in large part, been people who have caused a lot of that difficulty or been responsible for a good part of it. So, in this case, though, let me bring up what I was going to show you. Make this a little bigger, actually. I'm going to show you, uh, bring you guys up here. Make this a little bigger. But basically, this is just a little comparison of what we have.
Just put those okay here. And so maybe a little um, hard to read for now, but I'll make it bigger in a second. I'll read it and let me just at least present it in this comparison way. Right. So this is Revelation 1 11, just like we saw in the Bible Hub. Remember, we saw, we looked at the New International Version. And then we looked at the New American Standard Version. That's right below me. So right below me, you have the Revelation 111 heading. And then you have on the left, the New International Reading. No Alpha and the Omega. No First and Last. Next to that, you have the New American Standard. No Alpha and the Omega. No First and Last. And then below that, you can see the text authority. I'll make that bigger in just a second. But let me just present what you're going to be looking at. And then across the page... You can see, uh, or at least is presented, a little bit small, but I'll make it bigger. The King James that we looked at, and it has I am the Alpha and the Omega, or Alpha and Omega, first and last. And the King James 2000, with basically the same reading. All right. So the most popular and widely used Bible, even today, has the reading on the right. The King James and King James 2000, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Let's take a closer look at these authorities. All right, so Revelation 111 in the New International and New American Standard, New World Translation, pretty much, again, any English translation or other translation that's not based on the Texas Receptus, like the King James. So for the non-King James text, Textus Receptus reading, the reading without Alpha and Omega, first and last, our text authority includes Codex Sinaiticus, our, basically our only complete copy of the Bible from the 4th century. Codex Alexandrinus, 5th century, contains our best version of the book of Revelation. Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus, 5th century. Those are our three primary witnesses to the book of Revelation. We have some papyri, P47, it doesn't contain Revelation 1, though. But outside of, of papyri like that, these are our three primary witnesses to the book of Revelation. Now, in addition to those three primary codices, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, Ephraim I, Rescriptus, 4th and 5th century, or 300s and 400s, in addition to those three, we have the Latin translation, Latin versions that are, have a pretty stable text all the way from the 4th century to the 13th century. And we have the Syriac Peshitta, 5th century, and the Coptic text from the 9th to 10th century. That's the, the pretty much text authority for Revelation 1.11. And none of these contain I am Alpha and Omega, first and last. So then we go down, King James, and the King James 2000. Sorry if it's still not uh, too big for you. I'm just using kind of a... That's better. Right, so you can see once again, they both have I am Alpha and Omega, first and last. 
Text Authority. Andreas of Caesarea's Commentary on Revelation from the 6th century. And then there are some manuscripts based on this 6th century commentary on Revelation, the Greek commentary on Revelation, that also contain the reading. So nothing earlier than the 6th century, and the earliest being from a commentary not an actual text of Revelation. That's it. That's all the authority for that reading, for that critical reading, that the most popular Bible in existence in English contains and for hundreds of years has been confusing people, mostly because of the way it's taught and applied. But the reading, this reading makes that false teaching and application easier to do. And without the proper understanding and explanation of how Jesus and the other sons of God represent and speak for and as God, in the Old Testament to new, it's pretty easy to see why we have so many Trinitarians thinking they're right and we're crazy, right? Now try to remember that. It doesn't excuse people like Sam and others, but just know that people like regular people, okay? Regular Trinitarians, people who read the King James, they're not like Sam or others who are out there every day trying to attack people and their mothers and, you know, have a mission against what they consider false doctrine. No. They kind of just want to believe what they think is true. Like, again, think of other groups, whatever you're in, Watchtower, Mormons, whatever group. There's people that just kind of want to, that doesn't mean they're all good or anything, right? And we all have our problems and things. I'm sure they do too. You know what I'm saying, though. They don't get so deep into all this doctrinal analysis and text comparison and try to argue with people all the time. When they see something like this in their Bible, it's like so obvious to them Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega and that, that the, everything they're saying about Trinity is, oh yeah, totally. Oh, they don't think he's the Alpha and the Omega? Well, we think he can speak for and as the Alpha and the Omega. We just don't think he's the Eternal and the Alpha and the Omega. Because, well, he tells us that the Father has life, the real Alpha and the Omega, and he gave that, he gave life, eternal life to the Son. So they are not sharing the same nature. And he, that Father... Right. He's the one who has the name that's written on us. That's different from his new name that the Father gave him. That's also written on us. So, yeah. No, it's different from what you're thinking about the Trinity. That's what you do. You explain it to them. You know, if they're going to lose their faith because Revelation 111 in the King James is wrong, or based on such an inferior text authority in history, um, we're going to try to convince people that this reading and these authorities, the oldest and primary authorities for the whole book of Revelation, and three other Latin version traditions, I'm sorry, three other language version editions, including Latin. We're going to set all, the, all that aside. And we're going to go with a 6th century commentary on Revelation that after which became the basis for later text readings. Yeah, You know, that's why when I put those you will not even you will, if you pulled out a copy of the Nestle Alon Greek text or United Bible Society's Greek text and you look up the notes in Revelation to 111 there, there's nothing about this. Nothing. There's nothing in Amundsen's edition of Metzger's commentary. There's nothing in Metzger's textual commentary. There's not even not anything, right? Because nobody believes this is the real, the right reading. No, nobody really believes that except people who think the King James is. The only version we should use because it's part of a, an allegedly incorrupted, uh, uncorrupted text 
that's based on later Byzantine manuscripts collated by Erasmus in the 12th century and edited by a couple other people. And that for books like Revelation had to involve, you know, a collation of a variety of different texts, including Latin, just not with that reading. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a whole lot we could talk about with respect to the Textus Receptus and its comparison to some of these earlier texts. And as you know, we talked about even in part two, we're not here to advocate for any of, or even all of these other authorities either as being perfect. That's the whole point for of Sol's Veritas. We're not assuming anything other than we can identify the best available reasons if we try. <laughs> and I believe that's true. Well, I believe this is an example right here. How, how could we really credibly argue? I'm not saying you can't assume and just comfortably believe if you want. <laughs> well, again, I think it'll ultimately be a house built on sand at some point. How could we credibly argue this reading with this authority over this reading and this authority, right? I mean, even, even a person who has almost no or even none, no training in evaluating Greek New Testament texts, their history, their quality, their content, even someone who basically is your, just your first time ever hearing about manuscripts of the New Testament. Doesn't it look kind of different to you? Yeah, let's say it's your first time, brand new. Does that look like a better basis to you? Than that? I'm not saying it's impossible. This is again where Solus Veritas comes out on top. You want to see? Oh, it even oh, it gets so much better. We don't even have to conclude using Solus Veritas that this reading here, the King James, that we think at least I do is inferior and obviously not correct. We don't have to conclude that. We don't have to conclude. This is absolutely incorrect. It's possible, right? It's possible that this reading represents an earlier, this is actually from a commentary, right? It's not a text reading, but it's possible this commentator got it right from manuscripts maybe he had available that go all the way back to the original. And that all these, right? There's several hundred years minimum after the original. Of course, this is this is also and even more, but except in maybe the Coptics case, but it's still possible, right? It's not, it doesn't look likely by far. It's still possible this is all wrong. And this is right. But that's not the best option. No one would argue that. Right, and but it's still important. This is this part. This last part I just said. Those of you who argue like I do, don't forget. Just because we're choosing the best available option, doesn't mean the least best or lesser best options are impossible. It just like like with leaving and not knowing if you're going to come back alive or not. It's just not likely. So we go out and believe we're going to come back anyway, even though we might die. It's the same thing, just in a different context. So we're not ruling out possibility. You don't have to. That's another way you can get trapped by people who want to argue with you or doubt your view. Don't argue for what you don't have to prove. We don't have to prove it's impossible that the King James reading of Revelation 111 is correct. All we have to do, consistent with everything else we do in terms of using the best available evidence, like you should be, is show that the reading of the New International, New American Standard, New World Translation is better. It's so obviously better and more credible. No one should be choosing this reading. 
No one. The only reason they do is because they're not using Solus Veritas. Right? Or, I mean, people may still publish King James and not accept, you know, that the text of Septus is incorrupted, uncorruptible, but doesn't contain corruption. But pretty much, they're the only people that are going to try to argue with you based on things like, you know, what Bible were they using? And, you know, God wouldn't, you know, fail to preserve his word in some way that, that they, they overvalue that doesn't reflect the necessity of the text outside of just normal human transmission. But even with some divine element attached to it, because it's not necessary for us to believe that God preserves everything perfectly in an imperfect world with imperfect people and where the dragon is constantly persecuting us. The only thing that's necessary is the essential message. What we need to know. And we have far more, I think, than that. So this is all important, though. Again, just like with part two, that conflict in the Gospels, that's very important. Someone brings it up, we need to be able to tell them, well, we don't assume that the texts don't contain some errors. We already think that there were certain people during persecutions and after the dragon church took shape that they removed God's name, used things that weren't authorized to be used, like surrogates or abbreviations, no record of them being used in the New Testament, changed with the Old Testament that was quoted in the New right after the first century that show this convention. So more circumstantial, but then we have these other examples like staff, no staff, but we don't have the original. Mark was likely translated from Aramaic or Hebrew. And we have two other witnesses that agree and tell us what happened. But it's understandable because we can see in the Greek text, linguistically, uh, how a mistake can be made like that. And we don't assume mistakes can't be made. They just can't compromise the essential message. If it does that, then we wouldn't know what to believe. And so how would we believe in God and, and the things that we hold as true? The three things. So we do because those aren't compromised by any of these things. They're reinforced by it. Now, all this really shows the extent to which these texts were preserved for us in ways that even with some errors like this, they don't affect the message. We were able to resolve the issue with the staff or no staff using two or more witnesses because we did have them credibly and equally to Mark, but two. So no problem. We're just not using the incorrect view of inerrancy to do that. Same with this right here. Well, if if Jesus says he's the Alpha and Omega, we already understand how that works. We have literally an angel saying the exact same thing in Revelation 22 and elsewhere in the, in the book of Revelation, if not right here for Jesus, depending on at what point the angel starts speaking for him, right? Revelation 1.1. So we look at it all, though, if you look at that video I showed you. So it doesn't really affect our view. It's a big deal, though, for others, like Trinitarians. I, They see Revelation 111, King James, Jesus clearly talking, Trinity. Yeah, watched our people, Christian and John, you guys are crazy. You guys are heretics. Arians, yeah, go. We're going to sick Sam on you, right? Because they see this. They see this and think Jesus has to be the Alpha and the Omega. The only way to understand that is Trinity because no one ever taught us about the sons of God being gods who speak for and act as God without breaking the scripture. Oh, Jesus taught us that in John 10, 30 through 36. Yeah, right. You just didn't listen or you were listening to other people who weren't teaching you that. And unfortunately, that's something everyone will have to answer for individually. But when it comes to people who are trying to figure out what to believe and who aren't just listening to other people when it comes to that or those things, we have to figure out how to decide what we're going to believe. And Solus Veritas, truth alone, tells us, well, we don't have to have absolute certainty in anything, really. We just have to have enough reasons to believe that aren't going to jeopardize whatever it is we're trying to do in, in regard to the subject. Or what the belief is, belief is concerning, right? Like I said earlier, if the manuscript evidence was equal, well, it would be more difficult to decide whether the reading is Alpha and Omega or not. Wouldn't change our view ultimately, though. It would just be more difficult to determine the reading. In the case of the accounts we reviewed in part two and from the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, we were also able to determine what the correct reading was, even though there was a conflict. But we had to maintain the contradiction, which a lot of people who have an incorrect view of the Bible don't like to do. So we're not susceptible to that. We're going to try to be sensitive to people who are overcommitted to the Bible in this inerrant way. 
But we don't want them to build their faith on sand either and have their faith taken away later just because we were too scared to help them build correctly, thinking they would collapse during that process, right? Have a little more faith. I think people realize they're already believing based on the best available reasons, and that's good enough for the Bible if you explain it the right way. And it's going to require some changes though, right? And you do that to someone over something like the staff or no staff, that's a little bit easier to get them to say, okay, well, all right. You start telling people who read the King James that they've got to take out Alpha and the Omega first and last from Revelation 111. That's going to be a little more difficult to do, don't you think? Even if, like with the NIV and NASB right here, people who read these Bibles also still believe Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, right? From from early in Revelation, and although it's not, it does not even close to as explicit, or in Revelation 1 8, right? It's clearly related to 1 4, one who is, was, one who is coming, differentiated from Jesus. So that's not even proof. I don't know why they think that is. But they, they get to other texts like Revelation 22, which they also misapply, like we talk about. And they still believe that's Jesus, right? Because of the whole I, Jesus, and they totally dismiss the whole I, John, that would make John the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> it's unbelievable how we have to correct them in all those ways, right? See that video. So they still believe that, even though their Bibles don't say, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last in Revelation 111. So why isn't it a problem for them? And many many people who believe in the Trinity and use these Bibles also believe in inerrancy. But it is a problem for many King James only people or people who believe in the incorruptibility of the, or the lack of corruption in the Texas Receptus. Because they're assuming something that's not necessary to assume for their belief. I just showed you. They can all still believe Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. I can eat. I accept that too. I don't think he's necessarily, again, I think it's the angel in large part. This would be like the most explicit instance of him. It's in the early chapters, right? While he's still talking to the congregations and to John and all that. So this would be a more, the most explicit for sure. But I, again, the angel's speaking for him and God all throughout the book. So either way, the problem is they can't get past their assumption about the biblical text that doesn't stand up to historical evaluation, right? The credibility of the text is receptive in many ways, the history of the text and what it's based on. And for example, in, 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 in instances like right here, we literally only have a sixth century commentary and manuscripts based on it for a reading that's in the most popular and widely used English Bible of all time, that makes people believe in the doctrine of the Trinity more than any other Alpha and the Omega text in the book of Revelation. And then we have this reading that doesn't have that at all. Supported by all of this evidence. So I don't think there's any question about what we should do and what we should believe in terms of the text we're using in Revelation 111. I don't think there's any question this is the text based on the best available evidence. It's obvious, right? But not to people who assume things about the King James or the text as receptus and do not use solus veritas to validate their assumption, which wouldn't happen in this case, right? <laughs> so this is very important. I wanted to make sure you all understood this, right? That we took a closer look at this in terms of uh, a text issue that's far more doctrinally important or significant than the staff or no staff example we gave, although that's still very important. Clear contradiction, no question on the manuscript authority, still resolvable based on the text witnesses of equal authority and the understand and the explanation we can provide to show that there's 
a rational explanation for why this reading occurred and how it ultimately doesn't change anything. So in the same way, though, but different, here, here, right, most Bibles maintain that contradiction because the texts effectively require it, but they don't require it here, right? The text actually would require the text authority, <laughs> would require this. But something else is requiring this, right? An assumption that no one who believes in the King James, apart from the best available evidence for its readings, or the Textus Receptus, no, they're not going to be able to explain this to, to people who don't share their assumption. And even people who share their assumption, as I said earlier, Effectively, they're all built in part, at least, right? Hopefully not everything, but part of what they're believing is built on sand. And ultimately everything as it concerns the Bible and in inerrancy. But, you know, it doesn't mean they're not still a believer or God's not approving them or Jesus won't accept them, right? The problem is we want to present the best message, right? We're here to present the truth to people. And... When people can see we're not presenting the truth, whether it's over Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and whether Jesus told them to take a staff or not, or whether it's over the text of Revelation, and whether Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega explicitly, right? The most. Yet we want to tell them the truth, especially in a book like Revelation, right? We're not supposed to be adding to it or we'll be cursed. Add to the words of the prophecy of the scroll. Right, and I guess to some extent you could argue every Bible, English Bible, is cursed in that regard because they're either all doing something like this or even with New World Translation, right, sometimes adds Jehovah where there's no quotation. But there's different degrees of curses, right? <laughs> and this is effectively what the Dragon Church has left us with. But even with all of these texts that have... Uh, limitations, they're still far better than most, if not all other sources from the same time, and provides with sufficient variations from location and uh, language that allow us to identify effectively the best available reading without much question at all, just like we see right here. It's just in this case, right? Right, we would normally use all this and say, "Oh, okay. Well, that's how we know this reading's correct." The only problem is the reading that's so obviously incorrect or based on what is clearly not the best available evidence by far is in the most popular and widely used Bible. Doesn't that seem like a problem to you? Of course it is. Right? It's similar to the problem we have with the divine name, only it's more textually uh, relevant because it's resolvable with the text we have from within the source material and without not without having to go outside of it and look at quoted material. So this is fascinating to me how in spite of the fact that the authorities for these texts are so clearly in favor of one reading and yet the Bible most people are using, by far, has what no one would believe is the best reading from the evidence.